It is during my research for this week's topic, Catherine Bigelow, that I found out that she's the ex-wife of James Cameron, leading me to the fact that the entire Hollywood film industry is some weird dark style family tree where Francis Ford Coppola is Jonas. Everyone and everything is connected. Beginning with arguably her most famous work, The Hurt Locker stars pre-Hawkeye Jeremy Renner as the ranch-loving bomb disposal expert who takes too many risks for pre-Falcon Anthony Mackie's serious by-the-book soldier. The film is mainly a series of stress-inducing scenes where at any moment the characters could cut the wrong wire and explode, or get shot by terrorists, or even be betrayed by the people they're there to protect. Bigelow ramps up the tension over and over, similar to in Detroit, and we, the audience, never tire from it. Renner's character is empathised with, and there's a family backstory that's a little cliché, but still believable. A very, very good watch, and a well-deserved hit. Interesting note on this film. As the first woman to win the Best Director Oscar, it's sad that the film which she won it for doesn't even pass the Best Dell test. There are very few female characters here, and no interaction at all between them. War seems to be very much the boys' club, as can be seen in another Bigelow triumph, K-19 The Widowmaker contains only one female speaking role, and even then I think it's just one line. This follows the true story about a Russian nuclear submarine that malfunctions badly. It sounds like a Doctor Who episode, but the stakes are high. If the submarine explodes, it may look like the Soviets are trying to attack America, and their impulse to fight back will bring about a nuclear war. It's very exciting stuff, and a real condemnation of the testosterone that fuels the Who's Army is Better ideology. I really enjoyed this one, but it did take a while to ignore Liam Neeson and Harrison Ford's pretty bad Russian accents. There's a lot to like, and some real standout scenes contain some great prosthetics and makeup wizardry. We believe the injury detail caused by radiation, and it's this that adds the element of real-life horror to what could have been quite a generic action movie. Definitely one to dig out on VHS and a precursor to the tension style of The Hurt Locker, and later, Zero Dark Thirty. Zero Dark Thirty is an odd one. The story, whilst distinctly war, only really gets to the tension of Bigelow's previous works in the last half hour or so, where the film becomes more of an action set piece. The film follows Jessica Chastain as a CIA operative, fresh out of school and straight into the hunt for Osama Bin Laden. The film is chock full of cameos and bit parts played expertly. James Gandolfini, John Barrowman, Mark Strong, the list goes on. Chastain is excellent too. She's cool and aloof and at home with the torture scenes that often become too much for the viewer, let alone the victim. The film never judges its key players, or even the methods America is using, instead concentrating more on the facts and the human aspect, the bureaucracy of knowing where Osama Bin Laden is, but being unable to act because of a lack of proof. The film kept me entertained, and intrigued is probably a better word, but I doubt whether I'll ever need to watch it again. When Chris Pratt's character turns up, he lightens the mood, but I'm not sure this role, or this film in particular, needed the elements of Star-Lord-style comedy to begin with. I never realised, but Bigelow directed Willem Dafoe in his first credited role in The Loveless. It's a slice of life in small-town America, where a biker crew wait for one of their bikes to be fixed so they can head on to Daytona. In the true-to-life books Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test and Hunter Thompson's Hell's Angels, the bikers are big guys that go looking for trouble if they're ever offended. In Bigelow's film, however... The bikers are more modern, too clean cut, a bit more reminiscent of Brando in The Wild One, not as true to life, more Hollywood than rough and ready. The most interesting part of this film is the relationship between Defoe's character Vance and a young woman, who we assume is abused by her father. We see through Vance's eye and maintain an air of distance and never really feel emotion to the other characters. It's a bit generic by Bigelow's standards, but it does show signs of her trademark tension that she became famous for later on in her career particularly as the ending draws ever nearer and the group's infighting becomes palpable. In that sense, Bigelow did get bikers quite right. The music too is worth watching for, as Robert Gordon, who did it, also stars. Another early Bigelow work, very different from her later war efforts, is Near Dark, the vampire movie set in the hot American South. The vampires here are never named as such and don't follow conventional vampire lore. They do, however, still burn in the sun, which is their main source of frustration. It seems that every scene takes place just before dawn, allowing the human characters to just escape too many times. Adrian Pastor, Nathan Petrelli from Heroes, plays the rather lame protagonist who one night takes a fancy to a vampire. She bites him, and then her vampire family has no choice but to adopt him into the fold. 
It's a bit like Lost Boys in the storyline and the slightly quirky punk aspect of the vampires. There's some good scenes, but nothing we haven't seen before in better movies. It's probably the kind of film I'd absolutely adore if I'd watched it as a teenager, but it's a little forgettable when seen amongst the rest of the vampire horror genre. Buffy, it ain't. It's hard to combine the director of Near Dark with the director of Point Break, the far superior, more iconic film of Catherine Bigelow. It's nearly perfect in every way, from Keanu Reeves' performance to the action and fight sequences that have made it a true powerhouse film of the 90s. The film follows young American FBI agent Keanu Reeves as he's taken under the wing of Gary Busey's veteran counterpart. There's a spate of bank robberies that need investigating and Busey's character suspects a group of surfers but can't go undercover himself for obvious reasons. Step in Johnny Utah. Befriending surfer Brody, played excellently here by Patrick Swayze in one of his last more iconic roles, Utah manages to risk life and limb in white knuckle adrenaline junkie dangers, getting that high. And this film is that high. We join Johnny Utah and wish for him to succeed. It's been referenced in numerous other films, but the pain Utah feels when he can't get the elusive Brody makes us want to fire a gun in the air and shout, Ah! Classic. Thanks for watching my 15th, 15th review. I think these will definitely become less regular and more um, uh, non-existent as we exit lockdown. But never mind, we can always hope for a second wave. Um, it's been fun. Best, Matthew Wiggins here at Wiggins Talks Films. Ah!